it's crab live. Okay. <laughs> Good, sir. It's time. Can we start? You, you can start, of course. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second session of the day. Uh, first of all, as the president of the society, I want to thank our young uh, committee uh, for organizing such an excellent uh, event. Now I will chair this session uh, uh, with Charles Rizman from Adana, Turkey, and we will have a chance uh, to discuss the roles of ECG in cardiac implantable electrical devices. And now uh, I will kind of ask uh, Chala to uh, invite the first speaker. Chala, could you please do it for me? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Joseph Borovac. Uh, the presentation name is ACG peer to CRT implantation does shape, duration, or both matter? Okay, I'm uh, uploading my presentation. Can you see my uh, presentation on the screen? Yes, you can do. Excellent. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm right now on a on a on a business trip, so I'm uh, talking to you from uh, island of uh, uh, Brač, which is in uh, Croatia. Uh, it's an island, beautiful island nearby uh, Split. Uh, my uh, presentation uh, is about the ECG prior to CRT implantation. Uh, does the shape, duration, or both uh, matter? As uh, we will see at the end of the presentation, what is the current state of the mind? I would wish to uh, thank uh, uh, ISC for giving me opportunity to uh, uh, give this uh, talk. Uh, I'm a cardiology fellow at uh, University Hospital of S uh, Split, which is the largest uh, regional hospital in, in this area. and. Uh, we have a high volume of uh, patients. I'm not an uh, electrophysiologist or arithmologist by my uh, vocation. I'm, uh, uh, I'm training myself in uh, interventional cardiology, but uh, this was the topic I was uh, assigned, so I'll uh, do my best. Uh, so uh, we all know about uh, the established left bundle breach block criteria that we uh, all use when uh, analyzing a patient who would be appropriate for a CRT uh, device implantation, either CRTD or a CRTP. So we all know it's a QRS duration of 120 milliseconds or uh, longer. QS or small r big S formation in the lead V1. Also monophasic R wave in leads V6 and 1 without the presence of Q waves. And we also have this uh, criteria by Strauss that uh, added the notched or slurred R waves in leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6. And actually, that's what our ethmologists in our hospital use the most. They, they really like uh, Strauss criteria. And, and uh, from their experience, it's uh, uh, associated with uh, a better, better response. And, and, and we use it uh, to define uh, so-called like a true LBBV. Uh, so, how would the perfect LBBB uh, would look like left bundle branch uh, block, as we can see on this image, uh, shows uh, some of the uh, prominent features of what we would uh, consider as a, as a true left bundle branch block. So, I'm not going to go uh, in the details with this image, as you all probably very well familiar with all of this, but this, I think, was a nice uh, summarizing figure from uh, work by Stipdonk uh, in uh, Jack Clinical Electrophysiology. It's, it's a good paper uh, to read, so I would definitely uh, uh There are many criteria by professional societies how to define uh, left bundle branch block. Uh, some are done by European Society of Cardiology that we use at my institution. Uh, American Heart Association, uh, also uh, one derived from MEDIT CRT trial. 
And we also have uh, what I already mentioned, uh, Strauss uh, criteria with uh, these uh, notches in, uh, in uh, consecutive uh, or anatomically contagious leads, at least two. Uh, so, but the ESC guidelines on CRT and pacing uh, uh, currently tell us, uh, well, we know that CRT is recommended for symptomatic patients with heart failure and sinus rhythm that would have ejection fraction equal or under 35%, QRS duration of 150 milliseconds or at least or, or, or wider, and uh, LBBB QRS morphology. Uh, uh, so uh, the ones I discussed just earlier, what the LBBB morphology would, would be according to various classifications. So this is 1A level of recommendation. And similarly, if we go, uh, 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 if we have a slightly narrower QRS complex, such as from 130 to 149, uh, the recommendation is downgraded to uh, 2A level of evidence uh, B. So uh, the uh, right side of the screen shows non left bundle branch bulk QRS morphologies, which are considered to be less favorable for uh, uh, CRT implantation. And therefore, the level of recommendations are also uh, concordantly uh, lower. And uh, CRT, I should mention, is not indicating patients with heart failure and QRS duration un under 130 milliseconds without an indication for right ventricular pacing and this is the guidelines that we uh, uh, should all be uh, familiar with. So the studies show through time that there is a graded increase in mortality with increasing intraventricular conduction delay as we can see on this uh, image. Uh, uh, QRS morphologies with uh, very long uh, uh, QRS durations uh, are uh, followed by a significant increase in the percentage uh, of uh, mortality, which is uh, uh, something that we are trying uh, to address uh, by CRT implantation and has a, uh, has a, a real world uh, a hard endpoint evidence in, in doing so. Uh, there is also a prevalence of left ventricular dysfunction as we go uh, with the as we go further with the duration of uh, QRS complex, as we can see, if we go over 150 milliseconds, it actually uh, the prevalence of left ventricular dysfunction is uh, quite uh, substantial, which is, uh, as we all know, uh, very intuitive. But it was uh, shown with these numbers that actually this uh, uh, this percentage is uh, quite high as we go. It goes over 80 percent in this group of uh, patients. Uh, work by Poole. Well, this was a nice meta-analysis in JCC from 2016. Uh, shows that uh, the longer the baseline QRS duration is, the better response is with uh, CRT implantation. Uh, partially answering uh, one of the questions from the topic of this uh, of this team is the shape or duration of both matters. So we can definitely say that duration matters. And uh, the longer QRS is, uh, likely the greater uh, benefit is prior to CRT implantation. This was also, I thought this was a nice uh, meta-regression and uh, meta-analysis by Kang and colleagues, and actually shows that uh, the benefit, if you look at the uh, uh, Y X axis show, showing the QRS duration and Y axis showing the odds ratio for all cause death, we can see that the uh, longer QRS duration is from these seminal uh, studies with CRT, uh, there is a, a, a substantial uh, uh, benefit in mortality reduction in all calls that uh, the, the uh, higher you go with QRS duration. And obviously that's not the case if you go uh, uh, less and less with uh, QRS uh, duration. Uh, similarly, when we look at the heart failure hospitalization, we can see the similar trend. So uh, obviously this uh, translates to uh, uh, clinical endpoints, very important ones, such as all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization, uh, telling us that uh, people with uh, long QRS durations would likely benefit from CRT uh, the best, of course, after satisfying other concomitant criteria. This is the similar image showing that uh, when we consider the morphology, uh, left bundle branch block morphology is the one associated with the greatest benefit, as we can see in this meta-analysis, a much greater 
in, in uh, than if you have non left bundle branch morphology. So uh, morphologies also uh, do matter and uh, left bundle branch morphology uh, seems to be having uh, best uh, outcomes and best level of response compared to other uh, atypical or non LBBB uh, uh, morphologies. Uh, this is also a, a table that shows uh, uh, actually what I was just saying a moment ago. This is what, this was an analysis from uh, JAMA from 2013 uh, showing the benefit in all cause mortality, all cause readmissions, cardiovascular readmissions and heart failure readmissions if you have left bundle branch morphology and of course uh, a longer uh, QRS duration having the best benefit in reduction of these uh, events as you can see on these uh, curves for all for uh, uh, clinical endpoints, which I think is uh, very important. Uh, obviously, from like uh, pathophysiological standpoint, it is uh, generally taught that uh, if you have non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, you have a, a, a higher potential and higher magnitude of reverse remodeling with CRT, whereas if you have ischemic cardiomyopathy, you would have a better uh, uh, beneficial magnitude if you uh, implant uh, defibrillators. So uh, you would consider in that case uh, uh, ICD uh, and uh, CRTD uh, uh, implantation. This is the uh, 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 interesting analysis uh, that showed how the addition of CRTD versus CRTP in non-ischemic uh, heart failure uh, did not significantly uh, uh, impact the all cause uh, mortality. However, we got uh, some, as you probably know, uh, different results in a, in a, in a latest uh, sub analysis from companion trial, as we would see. Uh, so the companion trial, as shown here, actually showed that CRTD versus CRTP was better in reducing all cause mortality in non ischemic uh, heart failure. There was no difference between if you had CRTD or CRTP in ischemic heart failure. And when you analyze both groups together, so heart failure, regardless of etiology, ischemic or non ischemic, there was generally no difference between uh, the, the type of the, the device. So if you use CRTD or CRTP, it was uh, the same. And this was actually uh, very recently published in. in uh, Journal of Amer American College of uh, Cardiology. I think this is a nice, uh, a nice uh, slide that uh, show us. Uh, this is from Poole and colleagues from JCC. It's a nice algorithm uh, showing us what is the likelihood and uh, uh, therapeutic algorithm uh, uh, based on the duration of uh, QRS and based on the morphology of the QRS uh, uh, complex. So uh, without going into much details of, of this graph, I think it uh, summarizes uh, uh, most of uh, my talk and, and it's a good uh, read that I would recommend. So the take home messages would be, does the duration of QRS shape matter? So yes, obviously, the longer the better prior to CRT implantation. Does the morphology of QRS shape matter? Yes, uh, left bundle branch morphology is associated with the best response to CRT therapy compared to other non left bundle branch morphologies on the ECG. And finally, both the duration and shape prior to CRT implantation matter. So uh, I think that we should do our best in uh, making a good uh, patient selection in order to optimize uh, results and responses, and of course, optimizing the type of the device that should be used. Uh, I thank you for your uh, kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this excellent talk. I think we will have time uh, to discuss uh, all the uh, presenters uh, presentation at the end of the session. And now it is my pleasure to continue with uh, Konstantinos Tirian Talio. He will talk Hello. about the value of ECG in his bundle pacing. Konstantinos. I hope you can see you can see me and hear me. But I'll yes. try to share my presentation. Uh, we can see you very well. Can you see the presentation? Uh, we cannot see your presentation now. Did you share your screen? Now we can. Sorry. Can you see it? Uh, we did before, but not now. 
Could you please try again to chair? No. Just wait, just wait, wait, wait a second and it will appear. Yeah. Yes. Should I? Yeah, the full screen, you... please, Konstantinos. Can you see the presentation? Sorry. Yes, we can do. We can see. Could you please make a full screen? Full screen, yes, of course. First of all, I would like to thank the, uh, the organizing committee for uh, inviting me in this important uh, meeting. It's uh, uh, very uh, interesting, for, especially for young cardiologists. Uh, as you see, I practice in Thessaloniki, Greece, and my subject is the value of ECG in his bundle recording and I, uh, his bundle pacing, and I will start uh, with uh, the, the interesting concept that uh, came up saying that pacing the intrinsic conduction system offers a physiological uh, ventricular activation, which is very attracting. And it was first described 50 years ago, but the first reports uh, occurred 20 years ago, and it needed some years for the from the companies to uh, uh, manufacturers to uh, make dedicated leads and seats. And nowadays, many centers use his bundle pacing as a standard procedure. And uh, many observational studies have shown that maybe uh, his bundle pacing is more beneficial for patients, especially for heart failure hospitalizations, especially for patients with a V pacing percentage of more than 20%. But also, his bundle pacing can be used as an alternative to biventricular pacing, the traditional method, as it provides similar clinical and physical improvements compared to biventricular pacing in terms of QRS narrowing, symptoms improvement, and uh, ejection fraction increase. So, the indications have been implemented in the current uh, EST guidelines, so we can use his bundle pacing in, uh, uh, instead of traditional RV pacing for bradycardia pa uh, patients, where the electrical and mechanical ventricular synchrony is preserved, and it reduces the risk of AF, heart failure, or pacemaker-induced pace cardiomyopathy. But also, we can use it instead of a, a traditional biventricular uh, CRT, uh, for example, in cases where we cannot implant an uh, LV lead instead of a surgical epicardial lead placement. So the ECG can be used during the his band for the his band pacing during implantation with a pacing system analyzers or a, using an EP recording system, or we can use the ECG and plays an important role during the follow-up uh, uh, device, uh, using the device programmer or the ECG recorders, a simple ECG machine. But also, there have been it has been uh, suggested that some uh, the ECG belts are useful for faster and easier uh, device follow-ups. So the role of ECG during implantation and follow-ups is the th threshold testing. We can ad identify the type of conduction tissue capture. Uh, we, we can have selective, non-selective, or myocardial-only capture. We can evaluate the conduction system correction with narrowing, seeing when we see a narrowing of the QRS, and we can optimize the device. Of course, a 12-lead ECG is required because the changes in QRS morphology, morphology can be sudden and missed if we use only the limb leads. So we have three types of capture during his band pacing. We have the selective capture, where only ventric the ventricular activation goes exclusively over the his Kinsey fibers. We can have the non-selective capture, where there is a fusion uh, between his band and RV septal capture, and we lose the capture of his band. We have myocardial only capture. The criteria to see which type of capture we have is the QRS duration and morphology. The relationship between the his to QRS and the stimulus to QRS intervals, and the, of course the capture thresholds. For in these exams, in the first tracing we have a selective his band pacing where the QRS interval is equal to the native one. We have an isoelectric 
interval from the spike to the onset to QRS and the S to QRS, the spike to QRS interval is equal to the H, intrinsic H to QRS interval. On the other hand, when we have a non-selective Hisman pacing, the paced QRS is uh, longer than the native QRS. The stimulus to onset of QRS is usually zero, so we have a pseudo delta wave resembling interceptor pre-excitation. Of course, again, all 12 leads should be recorded and seen because the pseudo delta waves may, may be isoelectric in some leads and resemble selective capture. So uh, we have to be cautious. And we, when we do the threshold test in uh, his, uh, his pacing device, we can see the transitions in the QRS morphologies when we reduce the outputs. And typically we have three types of morphologies. If the lead is implanted directly into the His bundle, we start in high outputs having non-selective capture. When we reduce the outputs, it turns to selective one until we lose capture and the uh, intrinsic QRS appears. Now, if the lead is not directly into the His, but just near the His, first, firstly, we have non-selective capture. When we reduce the output, there's uh, only RV capture, and then uh, until we lose the RV and the intrinsic QRS uh, appears. So the transition for, sorry, the transition from non-selective to, to selective, as you, you can see here, uh, is when we pace at high output, we have the non-selective capture, and we, when we gradually reduce the output up to four volts, the QRS and T-wave morphology and duration changes, the, it resembles then the intrinsic QRS. We have a pseudo delta, uh, uh, the pseudo delta wave disappears, and in, the, in that interval, we have an isoelectric, isoelectric S to onset to QRS interval. Now, so non-selective and selective QRS has been shown that they don't have significant differences in terms of hemodynamic parameters ventricular synchrony and clinical outcomes, but it's important to distinguish non-selective pacing from RV myocardial only pacing, because there's a difference in the mechanical synchrony. And this study using ultra high frequency ECG recordings showed that both selective and non-selective his band pacing offers the same type of synchrony, but this is not the case in RV myocardial only pacing, where there is a more electrical desynchrony, which is not uh, very beneficial for the patients. But there is a problem to distinguish non-selective Hisman capture from RV myocardial only capture, since in some cases we, can shot, we cannot see the QRS transitions in the ECG. In these cases, other tools may be used and we can use some morphological changes in the uh, QRS morphology. And this nice study uh, suggests a two-step ECG algorithm with a very nice specificity uh, where the loss of his band capture, when we have loss of his band capture, the QRS starts having in the left uh, lateral uh, ventricular leads, lead one and V4 to V6, and not sledding and plateau, as you can see in, in the page, we can, which can help us to distinguish between the two types of pacing. Moreover, there is the R-wave peak time from the spike to the uh, peak of the QRS in V6 when we, have, uh, when we move from non-selective to myocardial capture, it increases to more than 100 milliseconds, which is very, a very useful finding. And probably uh, this, this uh, uh, index can be even more useful to the QRS duration because it's a, better, it's a better discriminator between the two types of pacing. It's easier to measure and non-effective by delay in RV activation. But his bundle pacing can also, also offer us bundle branch, bundle branch block correction since 75% of pacing, patients can have a QRS narrowing during his bundle pacing total or partial correction. And the main pathophysiological mechanism behind of that 
is that the, the conduction fibers, even at the level of the his bundle, are predestined to become either an, a right bundle or left bundle. Uh, it's called longitudinal dissociation. So if we pace uh, distally to that uh, uh, difference, we, we, we can, uh, we can uh, correct the conduction delay. In this example, we have a patient with an LBBB and a white QRS of 150 milliseconds with selective his band pacing. We, we can see a significant narrowing from 150 to 90 milliseconds. This is a similar example of his band pacing in LBBB. The, uh, the baseline uh, duration is 195 milliseconds and it's gradually reduced to 180 with non-selective pacing to 125 to selective pacing. So we, we can see a correction, as it said, of the left band branch block. The problem is that using only the 12 lead ECG, we cannot uh, predict which, pace, which patients can be benefited more and have a corrected LBBB. That is because we don't know when we use the 12 lead ECG where the block exactly is. We have a block at the level of the HIS or is it an intraventricular conduction delay? In that case, an uh, EP study with uh, intracardiac rec recordings may uh, seem to be uh, more helpful. And there's another, another term called uh, uh, his optimized uh, CRT, where uh, the his bundle pacing can be combined with uh, left ventricular pacing, as in this case, when we have even when we have even better results and an even more narrowing of the QRS. But also, uh, his optimized CRT can be used in RBBB patients when we combine his mal pacing with a sequential RV pacing with a nice ECG narrowings. But we have to be cautious because there are many pitfalls during the ECG analysis. And one example is the nodal capture in cases where we have an RV lead in our patient. And in that case, we, when, we, when the RV is captured, we have a fused QRS, which is something between the RV paste a QRS and the non-selective paste QRS, as you see in the example. Sometimes the his bundle pacing leads can cause atrial capture, and when this atrial capture is lost, uh, we have changes in the terminal portion of the QRS, and maybe this may be misleading, and we have we also need to be cautious about that. Other difficulties in ECG interpretation are when we have additional leads in our patients, such as when we need the backup RV lead, for example, or when we need an ICD lead. In that case, we have complicated device configurations and ECG morphologies. You have to be aware of that. And this is an example where the non-selective and selective pacing have exactly the same or uh, similar, at least, ECGs, where we, we cannot distinguish which type of pacing we have. In that case, ventricular intracardiac electrograms can help us, and we can see the difference in the morphologies of the electrograms, but the ECG is not helpful. And this is a, a similar example where the ECG is similar between non-selective and pure local myocardial capture. Uh, the pacing has a very long infrahesian conduction, and this makes things difficult to distinguish. In that case, uh, again, intracardiac AGMs of the his uh, in the his uh, level can uh, help us and to distinguish the type of capture. To conclude, standard 12 lead ECG is valuable for threshold testing to identify the type of capture, selective, non-selective, or myocardial only. To evaluate of con uh, to evaluate the conduction disease correction, to optimize our devices. And we have to remember that in most cases, ECG interpretation is straightforward. Sometimes can be troublesome, and a number of, fit of pitfalls have to be avoided. Uh, finally, physicians should be aware of the ECG features and pacing maneuvers needed for device interrogation and programming. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, now, Charles, could you please uh, continue with the next one? Thank you, Professor Gurney. 
the next speaker is uh, Pavel Matusik, uh, the value of ECG in left bundle branch pacing. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, please uh, tell me uh, whether ca can we, can you see my presentation now? Yeah, we can see. Okay, great. Thank uh, you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like uh, to thank the organizing committee uh, for inviting me um, to uh, present during this important meeting. Uh, my topic is the value of ECG in left bundle branch error pacing. In my presentation, I would like to highlight the potential, um, uh, the, the necessity of uh, ECG uh, both at implementation of left bundle branch uh, pacing uh, as well as uh, during uh, assessment of left bundle branch pacing during uh, follow up. Uh, as most of us uh, for sure know, uh, after pacemaking potential in patients with right ventricular pacing of 20% or more and baseline left, left ventricular injection fraction uh, of at least 50% uh, right ventricular pacing use cardiopathy may be observed in about 20% of uh, cases during mean follow up of about three years. Uh, moreover, about 30% uh, of patients do not respond to uh, CRT. And uh, due to the, these uh, obstacles, um, alternative pacing sites, as well as the combinations to, to mimic uh, physiological pacing were uh, proposed. Among, among these, left bundle branch are pacing, which includes left ventricle septal pacing and left bundle branch pacing. Left bundle branch uh, area pacing uh, has a larger target area than uh, with uh, his bundle pacing. It has higher success rate uh, in case of proxima block and potential to correct more distal conduction disease. Uh, during left bundle branch area pacing, we uh, generally have also low, low capture thresholds and good, se good sensing uh, parameters. There is no requirement for backup pacing these um, AV nodal ablation without risk of compromising lead function may be uh, performed. Uh, however, we have still limited uh, but growing evidence for uh, safety and uh, efficacy. Um, ECG uh, is, uh, is necessary to find uh, ideal or optimal site for each fixation to provide left bundle branch area pacing. During unipolar pacing uh, at this optimal site for each fixation where looking for QS complexes with a notch in, in the nadir in each V1. Um, other useful criteria uh, for determination of the ideal site is the site when during pacing, we observe the R waves taller in each two than in each three, as well as when we, uh, where we observe AVR, AVR uh, discordance. So we look for negative QS complexes in AVR and positive in AVL. During uh, lead fixation to provide left bundle branch area pacing, uh, we uh, observe the notch on the nadir of the QRS in uh, lead uh, V1. It's moving up and toward the end of the QRS and is becoming R prime. Here you can see um, ECG of the same patient uh, um, which was shown on, on the previous week. Uh, we observe also premature ventricular contractions of RBB pattern uh, during uh, fixation of the lead. Uh, these uh, observations um, tell us that uh, there should be caution to avoid perforation into left ventricle. Um, there are sev several uh, criteria uh, to assess uh, left bundle branch pacing. Um, Huang et al. in 2019 proposed five uh, criteria. Uh, two first as are the most important uh, and should be uh, met according to their definition. Um, the pace QRS morphology of RBBV pattern should be observed. However, it may be influenced by the pacing site, bundle disease, selective or non-selective capture. Um, left bundle branch potential from left bundle branch pacing it should be identified in patients with uh, left bundle branch with non-left bundle branch block during intrinsic rhythm while in patients with left bundle branch block um, during restoration of conduction, for example, during his bundle pacing. Left bundle branch, left bundle branch potential to ventricle interval 
is generally uh, of 20 to 30 milliseconds. According to Huang et al., uh, at least one from the last three criteria should also uh, be uh, be met. Um, and uh, the, the, the first of these criteria is that the pacing stimulus to left ventricle activation time, which uh, indicates precordial lateral depolarization time, should shorten abruptly with increasing output or should remain shortest and constant. Um, also, um, the other useful criterion is that is the determination of selective and non-selective left boundary march pacing, uh, and it may be determined by, uh, for example, discrete local components separate from the pacing artifact on the unipolar electrogram from the left boundary branch pacing lead. There may be also uh, evidence for direct left boundary branch uh, capture. However, it's not needed routinely. Um, it requires additional lead. Um, that's it all. Uh, proposed criteria of successful left boundary branch uh, are pacing, and they um, and they defined um, this uh, situation as any two of the three criteria, which are as follows: uh, pace QRS morphology of RBB pattern in B1, and the second one. A narrow pace QRS complex uh, of less than 130 milliseconds and short under 90 milliseconds pacing stimulus to the peak of R wave in V4 to V6 interval. Uh, in their study, they uh, they have found that the decrease in QRS duration is um, the highest in patients with baseline left boundary branch block compared to patients uh, with baseline non left boundary branch block white QRS complexes and patients with narrow baseline QRS complexes. Uh, in their studies, uh, they uh, found also that the uh, morphological pattern of the pace QRS complex in each V1 is most frequently um, small Q, large R, or large Q, small R. Uh, recently, uh, the V6, V1 uh, criterion for the degrees of uh, left boundary batch capture uh, was uh, proposed by Professor Jastrzemski and, and, and colleagues. Um, they identified uh, the optimal value of the V6 V1 interval for, for the differentiation between non selective left boundary branch and le left ventricular septal capture of over 33 mm, milliseconds. This uh, criteria may, may be uh, very helpful during um, introduction of left boundary branch uh, area pacing. For example, um, here is, is shown the patient in whom in the pacing position number one, uh, that there was lack of left boundary branch potential and V6 R wave peak time was of uh, 83 milliseconds. So it's over uh, 75 milliseconds cutoff, suggested, which suggests no left boundary branch uh, capture. Um, so uh, the operator looked for other positions, which resulted in even longer V6 uh, R wave peak time of 100 milliseconds. Um, and the implantation procedure was concluded with left ventricular septal capture only instead of left boundary branch capture, which was most likely present during the initial lead position number one. Um, so this interval was at the beginning um, of 46 milliseconds. Uh, we may also uh, confirm um, left boundary branch capture using simple indirect criteria during a uh, follow up. Here you can see uh, a patient with heart failure and left boundary branch block who received left boundary branch pacing. Um, during follow up, uh, left boundary branch uh, capture was demonstrated by observing selective to non selective pacing. Uh, you can see the corresponding QRS morphology and constant stimulus to left ventricular activation time of uh, 74 uh, milliseconds uh, in panels uh, B and C. Um, moreover, uh, in panels D and E, the presence and absence of discrete local electrogram in the left boundary branch pacing lead. From the program and during selective and non selective left branch pacing is shown. 
uh, at further uh, follow up at, at one year follow up uh, increase in pacing threshold in the left under branch was noted and left under branch capture uh, indicated uh, by left ventricular sept septal pacing to non selective left under branch pacing and transition in QS morphology with abrupt shortening of stimulus to left ventricular activation time interval. Um, in our own initial experience with left uh, boundary branch error pacing, um, we we had uh, a patient with persistent uh, atrial fibrillation and indication for pacemaker implantation who underwent unsuccessful his bundle pacing. His baseline ECG has shown the QRS complexes of about 110 milliseconds after after left boundary branch pacing area. Um, Introduction, the, the pace QRS complexes were about 130 milliseconds. We observed the QR complexes uh, stimulus to 11 per activation time was about 70 milliseconds and the V6 V1 interval was over um, 30 milliseconds, suggesting non-selective left panel branch capture. Uh, the pacing uh, parameters uh, were uh, very satisfactory. Uh, the measured arrow amplitudes were between uh, 11.2 and uh, 15.7 mi millivolt, and the, uh, there were also uh, very low pacing and uh, thresholds. Uh, concluding, 12-bit uh, ECG is crucial for left bender branch uh, area pacing implementation, cardiac pacing assessment during follow-up. Novel ECG criteria and algorithms are introduced in this rapidly developing field of physiologic cardiac pacing. Uh, however, still further studies especially with long-term follow-up are needed to strengthen and develop current evidence of uh, on left boundary branch or pacing uh, to improve clinical outcomes and facilitate effective caring for the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks so much for, for this excellent talk. Now we will continue with the last presenter, uh, with Dr. Mohamed Doroth uh, from uh, SKCA Turkey. He's uh, now uh, working in a uh, mastery in the Netherlands. He will talk about the selling genes if he's treating inpatient with implantable cardiac uh, implantable uh, cardiac uh, devices. Uh, Mohamed. Okay, thank you. I am going to share my uh, presentation. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Uh, yes in full screen. Okay. I have. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I have presented three CIAD patients with challenging ECGs. Uh, these cases are from Master University Electrophysiology Department. First case is 74 year old female who has underwent dual chamber pacemaker implantation four years ago due to type 1 and intermittent type 2 second degree AV block. He had no uh, complaint, but uh, before uh, her routine pacemaker control, a pathology was seen in her ECG and was consulted. This is the ECG. Uh, you can see here atrial paced ventricular sense rhythm uh, with a very long PR interval that gradually increases. But after first and ninth beat, there is no ventricular, uh, there's no QRS after atrial event. And next beat, so the second and tenth beat, you can see the uh, 80 millisecond after atrial spike uh, ventricular capture beats in second and tenth beats. Uh, per the parameters were as follows. The mode was AI to DDD mode, so the MVP mode was on. Basic rate was 60 BPM. Upper tracking and sensor rate were 130 BPM. Paced and sensed AV intervals were 150 and 120 milliseconds, respectively. So what is the reason? What is the underlying mechanism? Uh, the reason was mode uh, manage ventricular pacing mode. You know, this, uh, this mode is designed to minimize the right ventricular pacing and is uh, most useful in patients with sick sinus syndrome and intermittent AV block patients. Essentially, MVP uh, uh, provides uh, atrial based pace rhythm with ventricular backup pacing uh, without any AV restriction. And it, uh, it can uh, function both in AI and DDDR modes. If, uh, if an a AA interval, sensed or paced AA interval, occurs with an interpolated sensed ventricular event, MVP operates in AI mode. You can see here and 
here MVP operates in AI mode. But if there is no uh, ventricular event between two atrial events, uh, is defined as AV block. If uh, AV conduction fails only for one beat, uh, at rescue, uh, ventricular capture is delivered 18 seconds after atrial spike. You can see here second and tenth beats are rescue ventricular capture beats. If AV conduction fails for two or four successive A intervals, MVP uh, switches to DDDR mode, but in our patients, there is no mode switch uh, because AV conduction fail occurs only for one bit, so the pacemaker remains in AI mode. So uh, as a result, uh, this is not a pacemaker malfunction. Uh, this is due to MVP mode characteristics. Second case, a uh, 71-year-old male uh, with ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, whose left ventricular ejection fraction was 38%, uh, admitted with complete AV block and syncope, uh, so biventricular ICD was implanted. One day after the procedure, dizziness and presyncope occurred. This is the ECG after uh, one day after the procedure. It shows accurate atrial sensing, but there is no ventricular capture here. You can see the uh, ventricular spike, but there is no ventricular capture. And also, uh, white and regular uh, ventricular rhythm, you can see this is an escape ventricular rhythm. So what is the underlying mechanism in this patient? Uh, right ventricular lead was dislocated into the right atrium. At this point, uh, uh, the question is, why did the left ventricular lead not capture? Uh, the reason was the quadrupolar lead configuration. In this patient, quadrupolar lead was programmed as ring four to right ventricular coil. So this configuration is an unipolar configuration, in other words, extended bipolar configuration. As the right ventricular lead is located in the right atrium, left ventricular lead didn't capture anymore. We know that uh, quadrupolar leads uh, provides multipoint pacing and uh, in different pacing configurations. As in our patients, uh, it can be pro programmed as proximal to right ventricular coil or distal to right ventricular coil. These, these are extended bipolar configuration. As in our patient, right ventricular coil dislocated in the right atrium, the left ventricular lead didn't capture. So this is a, a pacemaker malfunction due to uh, this position of the right ventricular lead. Uh, third case, the last case, 78-year-old female uh, admitted with syncope and complete AV block. So did the pacemaker implantation was done. This is the ECG one day after the procedure. It shows atrial sensing ventricular pace rhythm. Uh, you can see the ventricular spikes accurately in V4 and V5 derivations, uh, but uh, there is a complete RBB block morphology. So where is the right ventricular lead positioned? Uh, anterior posterior view uh, doesn't really show where the lead is lying, uh, but if you look closely, there's a slight bending in the ventricular lead just above the tricuspid valve level. In lateral weave, uh, lateral weave uh, ventricular lead is going dorsally via PFO and lying into left ventricle. So in this patient, the ventricular lead is in left ventricle. In this circumstance, the cerebrovascular accident risk is very high. So the ventricular lead is uh, uh, was removed and uh, repositioned in this patient. This is the lateral weave after reposition. Uh, in this circumstance, confirming of the lead position is very important by using uh, imaging tools uh, such as X-ray, echo, even computer tomography. But in some patients, uh, we may see right-banded branch block morphology despite uh, the correct position of the right ventricular lead. There are some, uh, there are several hypotheses for these uh, situations. Uh, some parts of uh, interventricular septum uh, are uh, anatomically right ventricle, but uh, may behave uh, functionally and uh, electrically as left ventricle. And also some patients may have uh, excessive right ventricle conduction delay. So uh, despite the 
correct position of the right ventricular lead, we may see RBV uh, block morphology in ECG. In this patient, QRS axis is generally between 0 and minus 90 degree, and precordial transition is in V3 or before. Uh, some diagnostic maneuvers are beneficial in these patients, uh, just replacement of V1 and V2, uh, one or two intercostal space uh, below the standard position. Uh, this maneuver may uh, eliminate the RBB morphology, RBB block morphology. Uh, this is a case report from literature, uh, patients with DDD pacemaker and RBB block morphology. You see here the uh, transition zone is in V3 derivation and QRS axis in minus 70. After replacement of uh, V1 and V2 leads, uh, one intercostal space lower than the standard position, this maneuver eliminated RBB morphology in this patient. You can see here the second ECG. But in our patient, the transition zone was later. It was in V4 and QRS axis was minus 80. This is another uh, case report from the literature with uh, patients with uh, DDD pacemaker and RBB block, bundle branch block, RBB block morphology in ECG. Uh, replacement of V1 and V2 uh, lower than the standard position didn't uh, eliminate the RBB morphology in, in this patient, but they confirmed the lead position uh, by uh, echo and X-ray. Uh, it was in the right position. So as a result, uh, we may see uh, RBB block morphology in patients with uncomplicated transmittals RV pacing patients. In conclusion, uh, confirmation of the lead position very important in uh, challenging ECG patients uh, by using uh, imaging tools. Baseline ECG evaluation is very important and uh, we should check, the, uh, of course, the pacemaker parameters also. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mohamed, for uh, sharing this uh, three interesting case with us. Uh, now we are in the discussion part. Uh, Chalam, uh, as you know, uh, Melissa and Madam are our uh, panelists, and uh, as far as I see, they are online now. Uh, may I kind of ask you to manage this part, the discussion part, uh, and start to discuss uh, one by one uh, uh, with Melissa and uh, Madam? Could you please do it for me? Of course, Professor. Yeah, hello. Hello. Hello to everyone. I'm sorry for my voice, but I've been yeah. sick, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, the, the, we are going to discuss uh, each, each by, by each presentation. Yeah. Okay, the first one was the EKG prior to CRT implantation, does shape, duration, or both matter? Um, I think that the ideal patient who responds to CRT is the patient with an underlying left bundle branch uh, block. Uh, and patients with left bundle branch block conduction through the right bundle branch is not affected, and the ventricular activation begins in the right ventricle before it proceeds to the left ventricle intercardium. Um, the left ventricle intercardium is reached through the septum after 40 to 50 milliseconds um, In the presence of heart failure, this delay can be prolonged and it, it requires another 50 milliseconds to propagate to the endocardium of the um, posterior lateral wall and takes an additional 50 milliseconds to activate um, the myocardium at this side of the left, uh, left ventricle. So it produces a total Q, uh, QRS duration of uh, 140 to 150 milliseconds. Even though studies show left bundle branch uh, block patients um, have higher response rates, the large randomized clinical trials such as reverse modded CR CRT um, and raft um, have used left bundle branch criteria that are non-specific. I think that 
more studies are needed to identify the left bundle branch block criteria um, best correlated to outcomes in CRT and identify which patients with a non left bundle branch block QRS morphology could still benefit from CRT. I don't know what's your opinion about it. Chalak, Chalak, could you please manage this part? Uh, we have only five minutes, Chalak, uh, to discuss um, also, uh, the other uh, uh, presentations. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, we also uh, know that uh, decrementing pacing output and observation transition in uh, QRS morphology between non-selective fist bundle pacing and uh, myocardial capture uh, is the routine method because uh, it's fast and easy method uh, for uh, observation uh, QRS morphology uh, between non-selective fist bundle pacing and myocardial capture. But uh, Konstantinos uh, tell us uh, different uh, QRS size and QRS morphology with uh, uh, which compare uh, non-selective bundle pacing and uh, myocardial uh, capture, uh, like uh, uh, RV peak uh, level and um, the other uh, the other um, uh, methods we can uh, discuss, and uh, maybe we can. Um, uh, with his bundle pacing, uh, bundle branch block may be totally or partially corrected uh, by his bundle pacing because we also know that conduction blocks uh, may exist with uh, different levels in these patients and maybe his bundle branch may uh, correct the uh, bundle branch block at proximal level. So, uh, if we can uh, see that, uh, then uh, unmask the distal conduction disease, uh, which results in different chorus morphology. So we can uh, be um, always look EGM and ACG uh, before the implantation and after the uh, implantation. Uh, so I can speak with CRT therapy. Uh, we also know that the uh, left bundle branch block uh, with large QRS size uh, is the best response in these patients. Uh, but uh, last years and QRS area is the most uh, uh, favorite uh, methods uh, for a response to CRT therapy. We also know that as after the CRT implantation, uh, we look the after the CRT implantations patient ACG, uh, the, the good response, uh, we can uh, see the V1 uh, positive wave and D1 and AVL Q wave is the best response in the reviewer. Uh, so we can uh, check, always check uh, after the CRT implantation. V1 positively and D1 and AVL uh, negatively. Chata, uh, sorry for interrupting, but we have only two minutes. Uh, Mertem, can you hear me? Yes. Do you want to say something or add something uh, to uh, Melissa and also to Chata uh, before closing the session? Not done? I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay, I think Chala, you can go on, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, last, uh, maybe um, after the CRT implantation, uh, we can setting AV delay uh, because we must best respond with uh, B ventricular pacing. Uh, we can setting AV delay with beta blocker treatment or uh, pacemaker settings. Uh, so uh, it's the best response for the, this patient. 
Okay, I think uh, it's time to close the session. Uh, actually, uh, it's my pleasure to say that the quality of the presentations uh, were uh, really high. I really uh, uh, like to uh, uh, watch you and li listen to you. And, and uh, actually, I learned uh, a lot from uh, this session. So uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Chalar and then uh, Ma to Mohamed, Konstantinos, Paolo, uh, Melissa and uh, Meltem uh, for uh, making this uh, great session uh, possible and also to uh, the audience uh, to joining us today. And uh, the other session is about to uh, start. Hope to see you face to face in the future. Uh, and once again, many thanks uh, to our young uh, committee for organizing uh, such an excellent event. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good day. See you.